Hello, this is Cecilia with Kentucky Rose Devotionals, where we're finding the roses in the Word of God. It's Thursday. We're digging deeper um, into the topic of the miracles of Jesus and preparing our heart to receive a miracle, whatever it is that you're praying for, believing God for. Um, to do that, to receive takes preparation so the preparation that we talked about yesterday was was just number one standing firm on the truth of God and knowing that God's word alone um, is enough to keep us in times of desperation in times of suffering in times of torment hardship whatever we're facing in times of, of bad reports and different things that happen in our lives we can stand firm on what the God's what God's word says to us not standing on our thoughts or our emotions or things that we see happening around us because sometimes it, it looks worse before it gets better and um, many times we just have to stand all we have to stand on is is the, the truth of God that's all we have to stand on and that's enough um, then we talked about you know praying without compromising and praying without ceasing not stopping in our prayers and aligning our prayers up with God's word to receive and prepare for the miracle that God wants us to have. And another key that we're going to look at today that I really believe is is very crucial. Um, and it withholds a lot of prayers from a lot of people. And we don't think about it. We, we just kind of cast it off because it's one that nobody wants to talk about. And that's, that's having that repentant, clean heart. Um, and having a heart that has forgiven and sometimes you may think you've forgiven and then you see something or hear something and that that feeling is right back again and so when that happens we know we're going still through a process we've not completely let that go to the Lord when it still brings up bad feelings and, and harm and, and sometimes for some things it may take years for, for things to really um, clear in your heart and in your mind but we cannot hold on to those things in such a way that they they clog our prayers from being answered because we have unforgiveness in our heart so that's something that we have have to get out of our heart and I think today as we look at this miracle that we're going to look at today it'll really bring this truth to life of having a clean heart before God and doing everything on your part that you can do to be right not all things can be made right on the other side but they can be made right on our part um, and what we do and how we choose to respond and how we choose to act I want to take you to James first today James 5 verses 7 until till I feel the lead to stop. But it says here, I think this is very important for this time that we're in right now. We're in the last days. We don't have time for games. We don't have time for foolishness. We don't have time to go on a, a rabbit chase and do things that we're not supposed to do. We need to be and know that we're in the center of God's will. And this is why right here. I'm going to read it to you. James 5, 7. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient, he says. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's, it's the same as preparing your heart. How do I prepare my heart to receive the Lord when he comes? Here he tells us, do not grumble against one another. Brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The just judge, that's Jesus. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who what? Endure. Those who continue on in the ways of God, even in the suffering, even in the pain. You've heard, he says, of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. Job couldn't see the end when Job was in the middle of what was happening. At the end, he could see what God had done. But at the beginning and in it, he couldn't see it. He was blessed going in, though, and he was blessed coming out, wasn't he? And we got to remember that. The Lord, he says, is very compassionate, and he's merciful to us. And in that compassion and mercy, he's telling us to endure, to be patient, to wait on the Lord. He says, above all, do not swear, either by heaven or earth or any oath. Let your yes be yes. He means be truthful in what you're saying to yourself and to others. If you can't be truthful to yourself and to others, then you're lying to yourself and you're lying to God. So he says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no unless you fall into judgment. What you say, do. What you think, do. This is, this is what's going to make you be set apart and be prepared to receive a miracle from God. He says, if, there, if there's anyone suffering among you, if you're suffering today, he says, let him pray. I've been doing that 24-7, seems like. If you're cheerful, sing a song, he says. 
If there's somebody that's sick among you, he says, call for the elders of the church and let those people come and pray over that person who is sick, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, anointing them, believing, laying hands on them. And he says, that prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. But that prayer of faith only works when the people that are laying hands on have the prayer of faith operating in them by doing the things that he has said. What things? Not grumbling. Letting your yes be yes and your no be no. And doing things that honor God. God honors people who are faithful to him. And he says that, he, that prayer of faith is going to raise up the sick. It's going to save the sick. Salvation is more important than, than, super, um, than, than healing of our body. Salvation is, is way more important than that. That's what he's saying here, to save. It's more important that you be saved, that your soul be saved, than your body be healed. Because if you're saved, you will be healed. In Jesus' name, praise God. If you committed sins, it will be forgiven you, he says. Confess. Confess your trespasses to one another. Don't try to cover them up. But if you've wronged somebody, if you've done something that you shouldn't have done, confess it. Confess it in the audience. The Bible tells us to confess it in the audience of those you did it in front of. Those that you committed the sin against. That's how you make it right. That's how you truly um, make something right. Is that you go back to that person and you, you confess to them that you've wronged them. And you confess it in front of the people that you wronged them in front of. That's how we make things right. Now not always can we do that. But we do to the best of our ability to make that right. He says pray for one another that you may be healed. So you mean I have to pray for, for people who hurt me and abuse me? Yes. You pray for them. You seek the face of God for them. You, you give them to the Lord. And when you give them to the Lord, then your healing comes. Forgiveness isn't for them. It's for you. It's for you to be healed so that you can be set free, so that your prayer life can be opened up to God. He says, because the effective fervent prayer. Your prayers are only effective when unforgiveness is out of your heart. Effective fervent prayers of righteous people avail much. People full of the goodness of God. People willing to admit when they're wrong. People willing to say, I'm sorry. Elijah was a man, he said, with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and heaven gave the rain and the earth produced its fruit. Why did heaven listen to the prayers of of him. Why did why did God listen to Elijah? Because Elijah had the goodness of God. His prayers were earnest. His prayers were sincere. His prayers were lined up with the word of God. And because he was lined up with the word of God, he was in the will of God, his prayers were heard. Your prayers can't be heard when you're out of the will of God. Does God sometimes listen to our prayers when we're out of his will? Yes. Because God is gracious and merciful and good. But he's not bound to hear your prayer when you're doing wrong or when you're out of his will. So he says, brethren, this is, this is a key for each one of us. When we see our brother or sisters wandering off, he says, if someone wanders from the truths, someone turns him back. Let him know that he who is a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. When we see someone erring, you know, if I see someone walking to the edge of a cliff to fall off, I'm not going to say, oh, well, they're walking off a cliff. I'm going to say, stop. I'm going to, I'm going to try to stop them. You know, and the same thing is true when we're in disobedience to God. If you're doing things that are disobedient to the Lord, and you're, doing, you're, you're trying to make it right when you've already done a wrong, it, it won't work that way. You've got to go back to where you started. You've got to go back to where you committed the crime, if you want to put it that way, committed the sin, and, and try to, to allow through God in you to set that thing right as, as much as you can, to go back to set it right. It can't be set right when you still want to continue in the wrong. It's not going to work out that way. It never does. Things never work that way. So God is telling us today. Jesus is telling us through his word that that repentant, that cleansed heart is going to be the heart that moves God. It's going to be the heart that, that gives you a, an effective prayer life. And it might be what's holding something back. If you've got unforgiveness in your life from something that was done to you when you were a child. Or, you know, there may just be things that you're holding in your mind that you may not even realize. It could be past church hurt. It could be um, things that are happening in your life right now. It could be someone um, doing something that, you know, horrible. There's horrible things that happen to people. But that doesn't give us a right to hold on to it. Because when we hold on to it, then it only harms us. It only harms our spiritual walk with the Lord. And it renders our prayers useless. 
And that's what we don't want. We want our prayers to be open to go straight to the Lord. And only a clean, repentant heart does that. Only standing firm on the Word of God. You know, we can stand firm on the Word of God and we can believe, but if our heart is not yet been cleansed from, from things that we're holding, then our prayers are not going to get very far. So let's look at this today. Let's look at, um, you can find this story that we're going to read of this miracle that Jesus did. And he was really focused on this man's sin. He wasn't focused on healing his body. He wanted, he wanted this man's sin to be brought out. And he wanted him to be forgiven. And he wanted his soul to be saved. Jesus always is looking at the spiritual. He's always looking at the soul. He's always looking at what's going on on the inside. You know, people look on the outside and we see things that are going on on the outside. But Jesus is always looking on the inside. And that's something that we all need to try to do better. It's hard for us to do as human beings to see, you know, well, what's causing this person to act this way? Why did they do this? And sometimes we'll never know why. But we, we just, we try to look as Jesus is looking here, which is looking to the soul, looking to the spirit, looking to the spiritual side of this and, and, and realizing that every person, every person has a soul. Every person, um, God loves them. And even if they've done wrong and even if they've done something horrible, we still have to look through the eyes of Jesus through his lens to see what God would have us to do to be his love to the world, to be forgiveness to the world. So, you know, what I would ask you today as we're reading this, this one of my favorite um, healings of Jesus, and I, I love all of them, but this one is a this one is a favorite for many reasons. My dad always would, would talk about this one a lot. My sister and I would sing a song about this story actually um, but and you'll probably know what story it is when I ask you this question but would your prayers today your prayers are they effective so much so that your heart is so clean and pure before God that you know you don't have any ought against your brother or sister that you've you've brought everything in your life in alignment with the help of Jesus today would your prayers be effective enough to tear off a roof today would it be able to do that you know, realize, you know, that there's power, but there's only power in the presence of Jesus. And, and this group of men who brought their friend to Jesus knew that there was power in God's presence. They knew there was power in the name of Jesus. They knew there was power in being where Jesus was. And when they got their friend to Jesus, that's all their minds were, were focused on. They just wanted to, they wanted to be good friends. They wanted to get their friend who couldn't get to Jesus themselves. They wanted to carry him to him. So think on the goodness of God today. Think on, on what your mind is set on today and, and what you filled your mind with. And, and think on this, on what Jesus is doing here. We're going to look at it. It's mentioned in Mark chapter 2, but I'm going to go to Luke chapter um, 5 because that's my favorite telling of it. Chapter 5, verse 17. It says, It came to pass on a certain day, as he, Jesus, was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were coming out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Why was the power of the Lord present? Because the Lord was there. Anywhere the Lord is, anywhere the Lord is welcome, anywhere people are praying effective prayers because they're praying with, with the love of Christ. They're praying with unforgiveness out of their heart. They're praying from a heart that loves God and wants to serve others. In those prayers, God is present to heal his people. It says, Behold, men brought in a bed, a man on top of a bed. And you can maybe think of it as a cot. And they, he had been taken with the palsy. He could not walk, so he could not physically get to Jesus. And they sought means to bring him in to lay him before Jesus. It says at verse 19, they could not find a way that they might bring him in because of the multitude. There were too many people. And they went upon the housetop on the roof. And they let down through the tiling. They removed the tiles, removed the roof. And his couch was dropped down into the mist before Jesus. Now think of this. As you're sitting here around with, with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, you're sitting here with him. And you, you start to feel pieces of debris falling on top of your head. And I'm sure Jesus even felt it. Knew what they were doing. That here a man is lowered in above your heads. And you're looking up seeing this take place. What faith these men had. What, what love they had for this, for this man. Their friend. 
to love him so much that they were willing to tear off a roof to get to the presence of the Lord. Are you willing to do that for your friends today? Are you willing to tear off a roof through prayer to get to Jesus for whatever needs that you have? And it's even it's even more special to tear off a roof for someone else's needs. That that's an amazing part. You know, you have a, a, your heart's right when you're you're caring about the needs of others more than yourself, and you're praying more for others than you are for yourself. This is the heart of God. This is what He calls us to do. He says, "Behold, these men brought him in." Um, and and they put him in the midst right before Jesus. And it says at verse 20, when he saw, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto them, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. He didn't say get up and walk. He didn't say that first, did he? Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. He looked at his soul and he knew that his, his sins were many. They were just like any of the rest of us. We we have things that maybe we didn't even know we were hiding. Things that we didn't even know were in our heart till Jesus points them out and says, "Oh, wait a minute. You you think your your someone else has a a speck in their eye, but look at you. Pull out that big spike you've got in yours. You know, Jesus was saying here, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason and say, who is this? Who, who does he think he is to speak these blasphemies? Because who can forgive sins but God? Well, he was God. <laughs> he is God. Jesus is God. Praise the Lord. It says, when Jesus perceived these thoughts, he answered and said, what, why do you reason this in your hearts? Is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven? Or to say, rise up and walk. You know, he was more concerned about the soul of this man than he was about him physically walking. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up your couch and go into the house. And immediately, immediately, the Bible says, he arose before them and he took up what he lay on and he departed into his own house, glorifying God. You know how long it probably had to be? Um, for this man to have been able to walk into his own house, he'd never been able to do that. And God did that for him. God in that moment did that for him. They were all amazed. They glorified God. They were filled with fear, it says. And the people said, they, boy, we've seen strange things today. We never thought we'd see a man lowered in above our head. And, and Jesus healed him right in front of our eyes. You know, think, think on the goodness of God today. He is so good to us. He's so faithful to us. That he sees our needs even when other people don't. Even when other people think they're meeting our needs. Or doing things to please us or to make us happy. Jesus doesn't, doesn't look to do that. You know what he looks to do? He looks to save us. He looks to heal us from the inside out. He looks to give us what, what no man can give us. He, he looks to give us things that will, will enable us to get up. As he told this man to arise from this place of helplessness and to rise up and do what, what he's called you to do as his own. So, you know, this is what God does. He doesn't restore you just so that you can sit or, or run from him or go in a direction that he's not um, planned out for your life. But he restores you so that you can restore other people. He doesn't want you left where you are. He wants you healed so that you can bring healing to others. His healing. His, his testament to others. He wants to rebuild you so you can go help rebuild other people. These are the things that God does. You know, and we can look at this. Let's, let's look at Philippians 4 to go farther with this. Preparing our heart to be healed and preparing our heart to receive the forgiveness that God wants us to receive so that we can be healed. You know, in Philippians, Paul tells us this. He tells us, about aligning our mind with, with God's and to do the things that are pleasing unto the Lord. And as we're doing things that are pleasing unto God, then everything works together for good, doesn't it? Because we're united, um, and uniting our prayer with, with the thoughts that God has for us, rejoicing, he says, always in the Lord. And letting our gentleness be known to everyone. For the Lord is at hand. You know, if we if we really believe that the Lord is at hand, we'd sure get our life in order and do things a little, whole lot differently than we would be if we didn't believe he was coming. He tells us not to be anxious for anything, but by everything that we're doing, this is this preparation by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. All of those things connect together. If you're not a thankful person, then God doesn't have your heart. You know, if you're not seeking 
for the needs of others. God doesn't have your heart the way he wants to have it. The peace of God he promises to give us, to give us understanding, to guard our hearts and our minds through Christ because we are placing our trust in him. And then what does he help us do? He helps us to think on the goodness of God that guards our heart and mind. How is your mind guarded? Because you're putting your mind on the things of God, not on the things that are happening, not on the situations. But you're, you're beginning to think, as he said, to think on things that are true. What's true in this situation? What's noble? What's just? What's pure? What's lovely? What things are of good report? If there's any virtue... He says, think on these things. Think on the things that are praiseworthy. Think on the things that are of good report. Think on the things that you've learned and received from God. And if he did it for you then, he's the same God. He'll do it for you now, he's telling us. He will restore what the enemy has tried to steal, to kill, to destroy. God will make good out of it. And I'm so thankful that he does that, aren't you? I'm so thankful that he, he comes to us. God knows that we're not capable of doing what really needs to be done. We're, we're not capable of forgiveness. <laughs> we're not capable of doing the things that we should do. But by grace, by grace, through faith, we know that God's made us alive, as he tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, and because he's made us alive, we don't walk according to our lusts. We don't walk according to our way anymore, but we walk according to his way. We do the things that he's called us to do. To line our desires with his desires. To line our mind with his mind. Not to be children of wrath, but he says to be children of, of the love of God. To be rich in mercy with the great God, the love that God loved us with. That we're made alive with Christ. We're dead to sin. That for by grace are we saved through faith. That it's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. And if God offered us the gift of salvation, if he offered us the gift of forgiveness for all that we've done, who are we to withhold it from someone else? So we, we do that. We remember that he, we are his workmanship, he tells us. That we're created for good works and we're to walk in them. Good works bring glory to God. Don't they? They bring glory to God. That's how we know we're doing what God would have us to do. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 for more on this you know knowing that we can't in ourselves God gives us this he gives us Ephesians 4 32 which says and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as Christ forgave you through God God sent Jesus to be our Redeemer to be our Messiah he was kind hearted toward us and still is. He's tender hearted toward us. He forgives us. He loves us. And we're to do the same thing. We can't do it. But God can in us. God in us can help us forgive. He can help us forgive what we can't make right. So I'm going to say that again. But he can do it. He forgives what we can't make right. God does it. God in us does that. He helps us. He helps us bring forgiveness to, to places that we can't can't reach, places that we don't really don't want to have to deal with or focus on. But when we place a person or a situation that needs forgiveness in God's hands, look at what God will do with it. Let's go to Romans, because we've already been in Romans, so let's go back. Let's remember what he said in Romans chapter twelve, verses nineteen. Well, we can start even start we can even start back here at 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Don't think you're always right, because you're not. None of us are. He says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, this is the part people don't, they want to work, quote just that one part, but listen to what it says afterwards. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome 
be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with good. This is what God tells us to do. You know, and God's always working. You say, well, how can I forgive them? You don't know what they did to me. It doesn't matter what they did to you. What it matters is what you do with what they did to you. <laughs> that's what matters. Oh, boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But you know what? Whatever they did to you, you don't have to let it affect how you're going to live your life and how you're going to respond and how you're going to move forward. You know, let's look at First Peter. we got a promise here. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It says this, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. You think that God doesn't care about what's happened to you? He knows. He knows exactly what's happened to you. Does he care about it? Yes. And if you trust that he cares, then you trust that he's always working for you. And when you give it to him, when you give that situation over to him, then you're trusting that he's taking care of it the way that it needs to be taken care of. Because, see, the real enemy isn't people. The real enemy is Satan. He's the one that we're really working against. And he's working against us. And we've got to make sure that that's who we're working against. We don't want to, be, we don't want to resist God and be working against him when we should be working with God, not against him. So this confession, you know, when you when you make confession and you make your heart right before God, then this breaks the chaos that's in your life. It may not break it for that person that's that's doing the chaos, but that confession will, will set you free to have the prayer life that you need to have to get the get the miracle that you need. That miracle of forgiveness. That is a miracle. Forgiveness is a miracle. Letting something go that's eating you up alive, and that's what forgiveness does. You know, um, someone's once said that revenge is just letting somebody hurt you twice. You, you're just letting them destroy you by, by having revenge against a person. But to forgive them is like a release. It's a good feeling. It's a wonderful feeling to let someone go into the hands of God and know that God's going to take care of it way better than, than you ever could. Loving. Caring. You know, think of Cain and Abel. Think of, and I hadn't really thought about this. I, I was reading um, an author that I enjoy reading, and she mentioned this about Cain and Abel, and I had never really looked at this story this way or thought about what God spoke to, to Cain before he committed the act of murder that he committed. He let his anger go so far that he literally murdered his own brother. You know, his intent probably at the beginning wasn't that, but he allowed that anger to fester and to grow and he didn't deal with it it consumed his mind and you know as, as you look at what God said to him let's look at Genesis 4 real fast before we close out he said you know Abel had brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat and the Lord respected Abel's offering because he brought him a, a first offering uh, a acceptable offering but he did not respect the offering of Cain and, and Cain was angry with that and his countenance fell and so the Lord said to him why are you angry at verse 6 and why has your countenance fallen you know when you're angry and you're holding evil inside your heart you have a different countenance than you do um, when you're when you're doing right he says if you you if you do well will you not be accepted Jesus said to him God said Cain won't I accept your offering if you do right too and if you do well, you know, won't I accept what you're doing? But he, he ends it with this to him. If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Saying to him, Cain, if you hold on to this anger, you it'll take you over. And it's desire for you, it says. But you should rule over it. God is saying, Cain, I've given you power to rule over this. Me in you. By you rejecting these thoughts that you're thinking and to take on my thinking take on what I'm telling you to do because you know what consumes your mind will consume you think about that what do you let consume your mind what do you think about what do you spend your most of your day thinking about and, or talking to who who is it because that person that you let consume all your time is what you're going to be like you're going to be consumed by them so what consumes your mind will consume you. I want to be consumed by God. I want Him to consume my mind. I want Him to be my first thought of the day and my last thought at night. And when He is consuming me, then I'm going to make the decisions that I need to make that are right ones. I'm not going to allow Satan to have a foothold. 
I'm not going to open the door for him to hold anger and resentment and unforgiveness in my heart. But instead, I'm going to release that. Because, see, your healing isn't contingent on what someone else does today as I close. It's based on what you do. Your healing is based on what you do. And you see, Jesus already did it. Jesus already gave us the power to forgive. He already gave us the power to overcome. He actually gave us dominion over the enemy. We have dominion. We have authority. All we have to do is obey God for ourselves. We are not responsible for the other person. You say, well, they've never asked me for forgiveness. They don't have to. That's between them and God. But what we have to do is we have to give that person over to the Lord and we have to say, you know what, my healing, I need my healing. I need my relationship right with God, so I, I forgive them, even though they've not asked my forgiveness. I forgive them. I release the consequences of what they've done to the Lord. He will deal with them. I have to do what I have to do. I have to be free so that I can move forward, so I can move ahead, so I can do the work that God's called me to do and not be bound by sin because that's what it'll do to us. So if we're going to prepare our hearts to receive for a miracle, we've got to prepare first by standing on the truth of God. We've got to pray without compromise. Pray without ceasing. Have that repentant, clean heart. Praise with power and dominion. Speak God's word with authority today. And when you do, you better get ready for war because war is going to break out when you stand on God's word and you receive and you prepare to receive and you let go of old, old thoughts. And you start to try to develop new ones. There's going to be a war in your, in your body that's going to break out. But eventually, when you continue to side with God and you continue to obey the Lord and you continue to do what he's called you to do, there will be peace and joy and plenty in what God tells you to do. You will not lack anything. You will not feel shame. You will not feel hurt in your heart anymore but your heart will be whole you will have peace in your heart and peace in your spirit and you'll have prayers that will literally tear off a roof that's the kind of prayers that I want you to have today and that's the kind of prayers I want to have today is by releasing all these things over to Jesus Christ today all your worries all your cares all your unforgiveness that you may have had that you didn't even know till you started searching your heart God wants to heal you he wants to restore you so that you can restore others. He wants to rebuild you so you can rebuild others. He wants to make you new, all things new in Jesus Christ today. If this has helped you, please like, please share, and subscribe. We'd love to have you joining us um, each and every day on these daily devotionals, um, walking closer to God, finding the roses in his word, and getting ready for his coming because we know that trumpet is about to sound. And I want to be exactly where he wants me for such a time as this so that we can win souls to the kingdom of God. God bless you. We'll see you soon.